what seems to be going on pretty reliably so far is finding relationships of uh, complementarity and mutual correction rather than adversarial uh, processing, right? An attempt to dominate or destroy. Uh, right. uh, that, that, I think, for me, not only what we're talking about, but the exemplification of how we're talking and how we're uh, entering into relationship, how we're, we're, we, we are reprior we're reprioritizing, we're moving off of the product and the position and trying to really move into process and participation. And that's, um, well, that's, I mean, that's always been very important to me because uh, as you know, I aspire towards the Socratic ideal, but that is now even more so the case uh, for me because I see that ability to um, enact uh, functional as opposed to dysfunctional and adaptive as opposed to maladaptive uh, collective intelligence and bring it into something like collective rationality so that it can effectively, so that we can effectively aspire to collective rationality and wisdom. Huh. Um, that, that, has become, that has become very, very central uh, to me. And like, so the, the, the process of all this discussion over the last year, meeting all of you guys and women, and, and then get engaging in uh, the work on the After Socrates project has, all, has just, it has intensified and very dramatically deepened. It was already deep, I believe, but has intensified and dramatically deepened um, my commitment to the Socratic ideal of dialogos. That has now become um, mm -hmm. sort of very, very, I would say that's sacred to me in the way I talk about it in this series. Right. Okay. You've, you've already breached on some, aren't breached, you've already touched on some of yeah. the things that, that we were going to discuss. Um, sure. The first being rationality. And so you said, you said collective rationality. Yeah. So, so that seemed to be an interesting um, idea, um, and dialogos. So, so what's the difference between just ordinary rationality uh, and and let's say collective rationality and dialogue and dialogos? Um, right. So let's let's uh, well let's do it first. What's the difference between sort of ordinary or com the common right. notion of rationality and the, and the notion I'm arguing for. And then we'll do that sort of individually because that will give me an, an analogic basis for them talking about uh, the collective. Is that okay? Does that sure, make sense? Sure, great, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so typically, uh, and I know this because I teach, I teach on rationality. And so I get to see people's, and these are bright, educated young people. They're, right? And so they're sort of the best represent representative of what we call folk psychology. So within the COGSI academic world, folk psychology is the psychological, the implicit, largely implicit psychological theories that most people are carrying around. So people have theories, implicit theories about intelligence, oh, about rationality, yeah, right, story. right, right. And it's folk psychology. They have implicit mm. theories about how memory works. They have implicit theories about what concepts are. Um, the, now, one thing we should put on the table right away um, is... Um, and this is what I, uh, I spent a lot of time doing in Introduction to Cog Sci, is most of those folk psychological intuitions have turned out to be wrong. They have turned out to be uh, very wrong, and for, for a kind of important reason. Right. Uh, so, so let's say, uh, you know, our ideas about rationality, our ideas yeah. about wisdom, yeah, our ideas, our about, ideas about intelligence, you know, all, all of them are, are, or even, are very or even, distorted or very... Yeah, yeah very, yeah. very skewed. Um, uh, ideas about memory. Uh, let me give you an example for memory because it's it's far enough away from our topic that'll be a little less controversial, a little little easier mm -hmm. to just sort of establish. Um, so many people, we have all these metaphors. In fact, that bespeak this, we think of memory as like a like uh, like a room in which we store things, and we go in there and we retrieve it and we search through our memory. And so uh, the metaphor we have is kind of like we like a library, and we're sending people in and they're moving around. Mm -hmm. um, and, and why, and this brings me to the point I wanted to make, we have these folk psychological notions because we have to remember that in our folk psychological context, we are not primarily interested in explaining phenomena. We're interested in primarily predicting and training. So, right, mm -hmm. there's a language of explaining and a language of training. Now, here, here's what I want to say. If I want to train your memory, it's a really good thing to use that idea of a room right here here's a this is you see it on sherlock right you have your you have your memory palace or your mind palace right you have this room it's called the method of loci and it, let's say i'm going to talk to andrew and I'm going to first talk about rationality so 
I, you know, I, 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 I get a room, like a space, maybe this house that I'm in, I'm familiar, familiar with. And the library is where I'm going to talk to Andrew about rationality. So I form an image of you in the library and there's books and there's knowledge and oh, right, right. And then, then, then I'm next going to talk to, you know, Andrew perhaps about transformation. Well, that's the kitchen. And I picture Andrew in the kitchen and he's, he's doing. And so what I do is I make all these images and they're in different places. And what I do is I actually search. I go from room to room to room and my mind. And this is a powerful way to train memory. The, the ancient orators could use this technique to memorize speeches that would last like six hours. So it's a really powerful way to train your memory. And, so, and it goes very well with all those metaphors. The thing is, our, our memory doesn't work like that at all. That's good language for training it. But you, you, you don't actually have that sort of, you know, search, serial search. Because, for example, um, can you please uh, tell me Justin Bieber's phone number? Mm, no, 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 you don't know. You don't know it. Yeah, yeah. No, you didn't scroll through all of your phone numbers and realize that it wasn't there. Yeah. You just know. Is that, that like it, a heuristic or something? Or, or well, that... no, there's a, it's, oh. it's, it's, it's that it's, there's a heuristic. There's also a kind of parallel search. There's a kind of memory probably in neural networks as opposed to located memory, like in uh, standard computers. Um, and, and, you know, and your memories aren't stable. You're constantly mm. reconstructing them. You're mm. constantly rewriting them. That's why uh, confident, eyewitness, I, confident eyewitness testimony, 49% of it is inaccurate. 49% of it is wrong. Because uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. right? confidence measures how meaningful you find the experience, not how accurate it is. Right. Or, 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 you know, we think, you know, in a library, things that are, you know, uh, that are relevant to each other are stored close to each other. But like in your memory, if I give you, a, if I say color, red, say another color as quickly as you can. So red. Red. Okay. Or oh, uh, say another red. color. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Ready. Blue. So red. Blue. blue. Okay. Uh, now give me a, a word that rhymes with blue. True. Okay. So red is close to blue and blue is close to true. Is red close to true? Mm -hmm. No. No. But, <laughs> see? Yeah. Your memory. Yeah. So although we talk about memory uh -huh. and we can train it with the, and it seems so intuitive to us that that must be how memory works. Yeah. That's not how memory actually works. Do you yeah. see that? I'm trying to show you just in yeah. these sort of pony, you know, dog and pony examples that your memory doesn't actually work that way. In fact, it's taking us a long and, and and attention doesn't work just like a spotlight and all kinds of. Yeah. So I'm jumping ahead to say that this is what you mean about wisdom, too. Right. Is seeing through yeah. self-deception. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, or, or or these these forms can either lead to self-deception or they can lead to a greater understanding depending how we use them or how transparent they are to us. Or... Right. So, so the, the, what I'm trying to get at, yes, I, uh, that's I think a very appropriate way of reframing what I'm saying. If we don't pay attention to the difference between our folk psychological language of training yeah. and our scientific language of explaining, we can equivocate, we can confuse them together uh -huh. and thereby deeply deceive ourselves. Now, I and, think, and get into all kinds of new age nonsense. Uh, well, a new age nonsense, but also we could fail to uh, more powerfully um, even use our memory when we're studying for a test. So, uh -huh. so people think, well, the best way to study for a test is sort of read the material over and over again and rehearse it uh, because it's like sort of, you know, writing over and over again on the same spot in the library to make uh -huh, it sort of uh -huh. deeper. But that's not the best way to try and study for a test, for example, because you're not actually using your memory for how it actually functions. Oh, can I can I just do a slight aside here? Yeah. Because this is fascinating to me. I was talking to Zach Stein yep. recently. Do you know Zach? Do you know? Yeah, he, Zach and I have talked. Yes. Yeah, he's a brilliant guy. Anyway, oh, um, totally, totally. Brilliant. He told me that his uh, that he's a um, high achieving dyslexic. Yes, and he described his mind, uh, and it, it, it seemed to be very similar to, to mine. And, and I'm I'm pretty sure that I, I have the same thing that he has. Oh. In other words, you read the paragraph first, and then you read the sentence, and then you read the word. You don't read from the word up to the paragraph. Like you, uh, you're too in the gestalt, and then it's and then you have to get yeah, to yeah. the to the to the yeah. detail to the feature, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so an ordinary mind kind of or most I shouldn't say ordinary because nobody has an ordinary mind, but most people kind of build up from from maybe the feature to the gestalt and then a person who is, is sort of has that kind of dyslexia, it doesn't mean they can't read or anything. They just kind of do things in a different, you know, they, different way. It's a little it's a 
it's a little bit more complicated. Everybody, uh, I'm sure everybody right. actually simultaneously, again, because you're not doing things step by step the way we think in language. Yeah. You're, you're, so that's why we had to get neural networks to solve what's called the chicken and egg problem. Because uh -huh. when I'm reading, I, I need to uh, read the letters in order to read the word, but I need to know what the word is in order to disambiguate the letters. So you're simultaneously uh -huh. going from feature to gestalt and gestalt to feature. Sure. Right. So it's in parallel again, which is not something that's easy to, to put into words. Right. It's, uh -huh. It doesn't go well with sort of, again, our folk psychological understanding of how we do things. But it's modeled well in neural networks, for example. Now, the thing is, of course, everybody's sort of doing that, but there is variation on with, like how it's skewed. Some people are more skewed uh -huh. featurely. Some people are more skewed uh, gestalty, if you'll allow Got me. It. That's rather weird. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Ever. So my main point of all of this, and thank uh -huh. you because you've you've helped me sort of explicate my point right, in this discussion we've just had, is we have to be willing uh, to challenge our folk psychological notions of mm. rationality. Yeah. Uh, for, because there's, right, it's, very plausible that like all of our other folk psychological constructs, while it has some important truths to it, it also has a lot of misrepresentation and misdirection with respect to the phenomena. Mm -hmm. And so why that's a little bit more challenging for us, I think, is, is that, you know, if you, if you have sort of a, a memory that's not that great, it's a little bit uh, affects your sort of status and your self-esteem a little bit, but you know, not that much. But these terms, intelligence, rationality, and wisdom, they carry with them a tremendous, we identify with those aspects of our cognition very, very powerfully. Mm -hmm. So that's why people get very, very sort of err uh, about notions of intelligence, rationality, and wisdom. Uh, so again, we need to pull apart, right, our identification with these processes, which of course we should address it eventually, but we need to pull that apart from our attempt to get our best understanding of them. Because again, our ident just like all of our, a lot of our my side biases and our egocentric bias, our identification with these processes can actually deeply impede us getting a good understanding of them. Mm. I needed to say all of that precisely yeah. because I want to challenge two standard notions of what it is to be rational. Okay, go for it. Okay, so one notion of what rationality is, you know, it's kind of the Spock version uh, for, the, for, uh, for those of you, you and I of that generation, we know, right, th mm -hmm. this idea that, to, that uh, rationality is logicality. And you see this in, uh, you know, there's a lot of sort of online forums that sort of, that's the model of rationality, that rationality is um, to be as logical as, as possible. Um, and Mr. Spock sort of exemplified that. Um, and the problem with that is uh, it, it, we, have to, we have to set it into an overarching idea that ultimately we are goal-directed. We we're seeking goals. We're seeking to achieve goals. And so one thing we have to note is that what rationality means method, as a method for us is we're looking for the most reliable and systematic way of achieving our goals. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you say, wow, but that's fine. Uh, logic is the most reliable and systematic way of achieving truth. The problem with that is it's not true. Um, not because logic isn't rele relevant to rationality, but you can't identify rationality with logic. And here's the problem. Logic works in terms of certainty and a completely formal system. Mm -hmm. uh, and what that means, and I'm trying not to tr I'm trying not to presuppose too much, be presumptuous of what people have seen of this series, but what that means is you're basically into a kind of processing that has to check all of the problem space. It has to check all of the information. It has to check all the possible options. You, you have to be comprehensive and exhaustive. You have to be kind of like a, mach a machine of some kind. rather No than machine, yeah, but no machine can do that. Like even, yeah. our, even our best chess playing machines can't mm -hmm. search all the possible options. It's combinatorial explosive. They can't search all of the, like that, the, you, this, this, the, the problem of search is, is, is it still the profound problem. It's the, it's the, it is There's just the too much, too much There's information. Too, much, too yeah. much. So if you were, and everybody acknowledges this, who is working in, within rationality, Herbert and Simon, you know, I think it was, was it Simon's book, I think, or was it Newell and Simon or Simon's book, I think, Bounded Rationality, that Rationality is always bounded in terms of what's actually possible for us. Uh, Cherniak mm -hmm. talked about we're in the finitary predicament. Uh, and this goes to the core of my work. 
We mm -hmm. can't reason, we can't make inferences on the basis of all possible options, all possible probability, right? all possible information. That's combinatorial yeah. explosive. So what we do is we bound it. We zero in on what's salient. Here, you knew I was going to do this. Yeah. And relevant yeah. to us, right? And, and so that means before you can even use logic, you have to have pre-logical processes of problem formulation, the direction of attention, searching mm -hmm. memory, and those are not obstacles to being rational because they prevent you from being fully logical. They actually facilitate, they, they constitute you being a viable cognitive agent. If you don't have that, you're gonna be sick. The, ne the next task I try to perform, I'm gonna hit combinatorial explosion and then I've committed cognitive suicide. Mm -hmm. so, so if we're dreaming or something like that, you know, a dream is, is, we don't normally think of a dream as, as being rational. But it could, but, but it could, it could have a rational function, or it could have a. Yes. Is that what you mean? Well, uh, uh, more than that, I mean, I, I think that what you see is, uh, one plausible account of what dreaming does is it's a kind of optimization process on how your brain is operating, mm -hmm. uh, and so it's not so much the content of the dream, but it's sort of the way in which your your, your brain is sort of practicing getting better. At adjusting what it finds salient and relevant. So it does weird variations on mm -hmm. patterns that you've sort of acquired through the day, mm -hmm. and it sees which one of those sort of optimize its ability to track and predict and solve problems. That's why you're often solving weird problems in your dreams. Right, right, right yeah. Right, and so, and that, that looks all sort of crazy. It's all illogical, but it could turn out to be rational because it could be actually optimizing this process of relevance realization that is so central, especially, mm -hmm. and here's what I want to come back, if it systematically and reliably improves your ability to zero in on relevant information, and then I'm going to add something to that that is directly implied by that, it systematically and, reliable, imp systematically and reliably improves your ability to overcome self-deception, then I think that's how we, un we should understand rationality. Ra rational practice is a practice that systematically and reliably improves your ability to overcome self-deception and to optimize your ability to zero in on the relevant information such that you are more and more capable of being a good general problem solver and achieving your goals. And that's what rationality means. So it's not logicality, but it's also not just being intelligent, mm -hmm. right? Because the problem with intelligence is intelligence is basically, uh, Leo and I argue this, Leo Ferrara and I argue this, and I think you can make a good case that a lot of people are, are implicitly arguing for this, that what we're measuring when we're measuring intelligence is we're measuring sort of your working memory capacity to zero in on relevant information. And hmm. the problem with that is, and this is the issue, right? Very often what I, what I initially might find relevant or salient is actually a kind of bullshitting. It's actually taking me away right, from being able to solve the particular problem. I'm paying attention to the wrong things because my machinery is designating certain things as relevant or salient that actually will not help me to zero in on or track the patterns that I need in order to find my goals, right? And this is where you need insight. Yeah. This is, because when you have an aha experience, you realize, oh no, I formulated the problem the wrong way and I've got to change what I find relevant and salient. And mm -hmm. that means if we have an account of rationality in which insight does not play a central role, we do not have a good account of insight because mm -hmm. the machinery of insight is the machinery by which you optimize your ability to zero in information. And it's the same machinery you use to overcome self-deception. Mm -hmm. So the problem with that, with the, with uh, the, uh, the, uh, the idea of it just being intelligent is rationality so intelligence is what you're using well there's a lot of uh, if i could just there's a lot of very stupid intelligent people right well i would say they, they have they have the, the machinery is all there but they're not using it correctly or that's right they're, they're that's not using exactly. it in a, in a optimized way or in a in a let's say ethical way or in a uh, or, know, a, or 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 a non self delusional way, right? Right. AK, right? Right, and so that's exactly my point, Andrew. There, there, there. You know, you use your intelligence to solve your problems, but that can generate all kinds of skewed salience landscapes, capacities for acting yeah. immorally, for acting in a self deceptive manner. Rationality is what you use in order to deal with all of that 
right? All of those right. negative side effects generated by, by using your intelligence in an adaptive manner. So the rationality is, is, is a practice uh, rather than uh, something you're just born with. In other oh, words. yeah. No, no. You, that, you that's very to important to think, to, to, to know that, right? That yes, it's something yes. you work on. Uh, and it's, it's, you said it was aspirational, right? It's something, yes, yes. Something you it was want, you want to, to it. become a rational person, even though... Um, it seems like an ideal, like uh, it's not a very likely uh, scenario that you would become 100% uh, rational. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't even know if um, if that's possible. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't even know if that's the correct way to frame it, uh, okay. uh, because because it uh, it brings with it a sense of an idea of completeness or finality, and because your relevance, real, because your intelligence is a self-organizing, evolving, dynamical system. And because the world is a self-organizing dynamical system, there's no there's no sort of final state you can get into where you can say where you can pronounce now I am forever free from yeah, the yeah. problem. So it's of all process. process, sort of. It's all process. All right. Well, this is this is how I interpret the first noble truth of Buddhism. I'm not a Buddhist, mm -hmm. but like even though you know Alexander says I am, but right, <laughs> uh, right. Uh, uh, um, because, but I interpret it as, you know, not that all of life is suffering, because that makes no sense, but that no matter where you turn, there is no place in which you can be free from the threat of self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior, no matter how smart you are, no matter how intelligent you are. Yeah, you'd always so, be missing something, wouldn't you? You'd always have a blind spot somewhere. Oh, uh, uh, or you always have a lot of blind spots. Uh, a you lot know. of them. Yeah. So, you know, if you take a look, a lot of psychology is going through the replication crisis. Results are getting replicated. Well, you know what is robustly getting replicated time and time again? All this stuff about cognitive bias, all this stuff about self-deception, all this stuff about how intelligence is necessary but not sufficient for rationality. All of that is very, very robust. It is not going through the replication application crisis. It's an aspect of our cognition that we should have very strong confidence in, which means, given these two points, we should not think of rationality as identical to either logicality or either to our intelligence, our sort of uh, our, our innately given problem solving capacity, because that's what I think um, intelligence is. And, 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 and I think this would actually ameliorate a lot of useless debates. People don't like the idea you know, that IQ is fixed because then they think they're doomed, right? They think, oh, yeah. no, yeah. right? Because, yeah. you know, and, and then there's all these objections and, right? And, but, and this is, I think, this is an argument I get from Stanovich. We shouldn't be caring so much about intelligence. Yeah, G is a good predictor. It's one of our best. G is measures of general intelligence. Do you know what I should all, I really care about about you? How rational you are. Yeah. Because that's going to predict how moral you behave, how how uh, how you can overcome egocentrism, how you're less self-deceptive. I can you're more tr like. What right? about the whole effective world, right? Uh, uh, and uh, all that. Because because uh, I was you know I was, I was thinking about how how um, when I was talking to Guy last night, uh, he kind of lives in that kind of a, a realm. He's he's very rational as well, but but he doesn't he doesn't. He, he doesn't swim in rational arguments. He, he kind of swims in something else or, or well, but, but, oh, but, that's I mean, but again, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I, I'm still, I still have this narrow definition of rationality when I'm, I'm talking. No, but that's, but that's great. What you, you just, that's a beautiful segue for me because the, the, I, 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 so I've I, two ways in which uh, the folk psychological notion is too narrow. It either identify and it often does it, both in a contradictory manner, but uh -huh. it often identifies rationality with being intelligent, yeah, right, and uh, right, and therefore fixed like intelligence. But no, it's not rationality is not intelligence, and rationality is developmental. You can get better and better and better. Mm -hmm. You can inspire, mm -hmm. and it's not equivalent to ra to logicality. Just being good at logic is not. It's the evidence is clear. It does not make you very rational, actually. Rationality is about knowing where, when. It's about rate rationing. It's about knowing where, when, and to what degree to be logical. Mm -hmm. Now, this brings what you just said brings me up to the third way in the folk psychological notion. Ours, not cross culturally, but ours in the West is deficient. Mm -hmm. Is we limit rationality to just inferential processes about belief. Okay. Right. We say, oh, we limit it to just to use some of my terminology. We limit rationality to just propositional knowing and that the, with the goal uh, the sole goal of rationality is to get true beliefs 
which of course is ridiculous. Um, I could get in, you know, an indefinitely large number of true beliefs in my room by, you know, you know, noting correlations between how many paper clips are in the room and how many cups are in the room. Like the amount of information in this room, the amount of true information is overwhelming. What we actually want is true information that's relevant to us, relevant yeah. to our problem solving tasks, relevant to our moral undertakings, et cetera. Yeah, I was listening to somebody who was talking about intelligence. I put that in the article I write it, and he said mm -hmm. that wisdom is when you can say, so what? Like you're, you can discard um, all that information, which is yes. not important. And, yeah. and you, can, you can narrow in on, on, on what really matters. Like, yes. In a deep exactly. existential way, not not on 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 pro on, you know pro, as you say products or or yeah. Um, I mean, sometimes our goals are genuinely epistemic. We want to know the true causes mm -hmm. of things, yeah. but and this is the point I want to make. But if we bring in the many other ways in which we try to couple ourselves to reality, our procedural knowing. Well, that our procedural knowing. Well, then we want systematically and reliable ways of getting and improving our skills. Mm -hmm. Our perspectival knowing. Well, then we want systematically and reliable way of improving our, right, our salience landscaping and our ability to generate a sense of, right, presence. Our participatory knowing. We want systematic and reliable ways of getting into the best, uh, right, kind of existential mode. For example, should I be in the having mode right now? Should I be mm -hmm. in the being mode? Should I be treating you categorically? Should I be treating you individually? Like all of those kinds of things. And how am I appropriately set? And you see, and the thing about Guy, mm -hmm. His guy is swimming, right? First of all, relevance is not cold calculation. It's not logic. Relevance yeah. is about a, an act of commitment. I am committing my precious time and resources in a gamble, a risky gamble, that this, I care. I'm yeah. caring about this information rather than that information because I'm ultimately trying to take, take care of myself and take care of the Well, this word I'm care right. seems very important because, you know, one of the, reasons um some people would would you know want to be transrational or have you know post-rational experiences or have experiences that were not what they would consider to be rational um was, is because rationality often seems like a cold form of analysis oh, yeah. I, I, but I, but you're saying exactly the opposite right i'm saying exactly the opposite so if you and this goes back to socrates so the socratic platonic tradition right all of this, you know, this argumentative stuff, the inferential stuff is bound up with also abilities to change perspective, to cultivate sophrison, you know, um, a, a, a kind of salience lens. That's what we, we, that's one of the cardinal virtues. We usually uh, translate it very poorly as moderation, but it's much more like your salience landscaping has evolved. So it spontaneously self-organizes to tempt you towards what is more true, towards more Right, it's basically uh -huh. your perspectival knowing has been trained so that you're much less subject to bullshit, right? Yeah. Uh, so you, you, you know, usually we're yeah. This is something you said in the series. Usually we're tempted to bullshit, yeah. but I like you say, what what if we were tempted to, to the good, the good yeah. or whatever that might be? Yeah, and, and wouldn't and and wouldn't that be part of what a wise person has? They they would come into a situation, right? And 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 before they're getting into perhaps any specific inferential processing, they're sort of drawn to what's not only what's relevant, but what's, you know, uh, you know, in, in a problem solving sense, but maybe what's also relevant in a moral sense, uh, mm -hmm. what needs to be addressed. You see, that's the thing about Socrates, right? A a and the platonic tradition, right? All of that argumentative stuff is bound up with love. It's profoundly. So mm -hmm. we see these, you know, post romantic tradition, we yeah. see these as a uh, love, you know, spirituality is about love and science is about reason and the two are opposed and they're yeah. separate. No, in the whole Neo-Socratic, Neoplatonic tradition, they're bound up together. In fact, Socrates, you know, Socrates claimed to know ta erotica. He he knew what to care about. He 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 did he did he did. there were some things he actually did claim to know. People That's know a good he, definition of wisdom, isn't it? To know what to yes, care about. Yes, to know. Yeah. So he he was seeking a rationality of appropriate caring. Hmm. Right? Uh, now that caring can be caring for the truth. It can be also caring for like caring about what's right. It can be caring about right uh, what's beautiful. You see, all, and and a lot of the Socratic dialogue is not about coming to an argumentative conclusion. Mm -hmm. It's about trying to bring in the perspectival and participatory knowing, right? And and that's why Socrates often doesn't use analogies to argument. He often uses analogies to skills. 
because procedural knowledge is a little bit closer than propositional knowledge to mm. perspectival and participatory, right? And so he's trying, you're bringing in the perspectival and the participatory knowing because you're trying to shape it. Again, you, you, often the dialogues don't end in any kind of inferential conclusion. They're often, right. they're also, they also often leave you well. Oh, we don't know, or we don't have any clear conclusion well, about well, what. Well, it's like a, I guess it's like uh, it's like good art or something. It doesn't. Yes. It doesn't wrap up the whole story, so you're you you're satisfied with your product uh, in like a like a Hollywood movie. It it kind of opens a new vista for you. It opens a new vista, and it also. Also, it also launches you onto aspirational transformation. So what you'll uh -huh. see at the end of a lot of these dialogues is there's no argumentative conclusion, but you'll see the, so uh, like there'll be, uh, 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 like there's a dialogue on courage and there's two people arguing. And it's interesting because um, they're arguing about courage and they represent these two positions I'm talking about. There's a general and he thinks just his common sense notion of what courage is. That's that's the correct. So oh, yeah, I've read that. Yeah, yeah. Right, he's full psychological. And then there's a guy who's a sophist and he has this sort of technical sort of logical definition, right, that he's heard from somebody else. Right. And Socrates rejects both of those. And, 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 it, and then you get to the end and there's no conclusion as to what courage is other than the fact that these two approaches Mm -hmm. have been shown to be inadequate. But what you see is both of the generals say they want their sons to come and learn from Socrates, to spend time with Socrates, uh -huh. because the, the, the process has... Well, maybe, them. because maybe perhaps courage is, is not something that you can define. It's something that, that it's it's not something you, you can define in any absolute sense. No, it exactly. made, made me think about Heidegger and, and, and what he talked, when he talked about thinking and how, how yes. you know, concepts... A true concept is something that doesn't have any kind of finitude to it. It just reveals itself more and more over time, more and more and more truth yep. over, over time, and 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 you can never pin pin it down. Or that's what I, that goes back to what I was saying earlier about you have to get a, away from models that seek completeness and being uh -huh. a finished thing. And I think that's exactly the right. So Socrates, the point of the dialogue is you have to step back. And this is why Plato writes dialogues as opposed to just straight arguments. Hmm. The point is the you, you can't get a definition of courage, but as you watch Socrates move between these two positions, the Scylla and Charybdis of going oh. wrong, you get a sense of how to get on the track, how to aspire to courage, and that Socrates is reliably on it. So you develop a kind of trust in following Socrates, because he has exemplified, even though he can't explicate, courage. Hmm. Hmm. So the idea that I would like to bring into a lot of current practices, like guys circling, is to not always just be participating in the process, but also to step back and look at what we're exemplifying in the process. Um, so, like you know, in circling, you're, you're doing all these things to maintain the flow mm -hmm. of the distributed cognition mm -hmm. and, and everybody's feeling that it's very meaningful, but whatever you step back and say, yeah, but, but what is meaning? What is meaning in this situation? What, and not just abstractly, because you've got the phenomenology, it's active, it's engaged, and you have multiple people there that have multiple perspectives on it. And you can start doing something like a Socratic dialogue. Well, what is it to be meaningfully connected? Mm -hmm. and, then, and then what you can do is check with, you know, are we still exemplifying the phenomena we're trying to explicate? And you, oh, try to keep the two, yeah. you try to keep the two, like, tightly coupled together. So you don't, you, you're constantly moving. Chris Master Pietro and I talk about this in the, in the chapter we wrote on Dialogos. You're constantly sort of, you, you've got, you're constantly moving, but in an integrated fashion between theor theory and theoria, between, you know, theorizing and then going back and really theoria, really... Testing it out the, in the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, really, uh -huh. really... Ex Right, really experiencing it in action. Mm -hmm. right? And so rationality mm -hmm. then is would be for collective intelligence would be to try and find systematic and reliable ways of getting that kind of pattern of communication and connection between people in place. Hmm. Very, very interesting. Yeah. It seems to me that that's very important uh, now, especially mm -hmm. because we're in a very anti-rational time or, or something. Right. Well, Everything is about sensation and feeling. And um, I don't want to be, you know, say that feeling is bad, but, but yeah. er everything is about, er every, everything is based on, um, you know, clicks and likes and salience. experience and salience. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So that seems to be very well, Im important to, 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 yeah, okay, that, you know, there's the ocean of experience and then there's also stepping out and coming back in and going yep. in and out of that. Mm. I think it's very needed. And I, w I would want to, I would want to say that let's use the Socratic uh, model we just had and also the, the, some of the uh, points we've made. I think our, our time is um, irrational or uh, lacking in rationality in two senses. In one sense, uh -huh. we're like the general, the one general who just, let's go with my intuition and my impulse and whatever just sort of comes to yeah. me. And then we have, no, no, let's be rational. Let's be technical. Oh yeah, exactly. Right. That's what I was going to say as well. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. What, it's this, this hyper rationality, which is, is, uh, I don't think it's rationality at all, which you would um, say is not rationality at all. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I, it, I'm it, still have this def. I still have the folk, mm -hmm definition of rationality in my head so it's almost hard for me to have the conversation until i've redefined the term rationality i, don't, I completely for myself. understand you know what i mean and like i said you're struggling against not only just sort of the familiarity of your folk psychological conception you're also struggling against the fact that we have set up all these cultural patterns of identification and evaluation around these terms mm -hmm. right and we reward people and we claim this and we claim that um and um, that's also, I think, uh, acting as an obstacle to trying to get back to a yeah. notion of rationality that actually starts to overlap with wisdom. You see, that's what the, these two, mm -hmm. these two, this notion of rationality is just being sort of, you know, practical, you know, uh, intelligence problem solving, or the notion of rationality is just being sort of good logicality. It, it, it tells me nothing about wisdom, basically. Yeah. It doesn't really help me. Uh, it doesn't help me with that systematic and reliable way of cutting through bullshit, getting to what's relevant, and then also aspiring, right? Properly aspiring so that my development is constantly evolving with reality in a, yeah. in, 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 in a sort of uh, continuous coupling. Hmm. None of that is given to me by those models. Hmm. So you, you talked to Ian McGilchrist recently. Oh no? my gosh. So, so I, I, you know, I'm very interested because you know, your your story is almost the opposite of his, but you're probably saying the same thing. Um, yeah. You know, because he talks about he talks about left brain, right brain. You talk about opponent processing, you very working, much working together. Those seem to be kind of analogous. Whereas he says that rationality is just cutting the world up into bits and turning us into bureaucratic monsters. Uh, yeah. And uh, and we need to get more into the right brain wor world of 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 you know. So uh, a feeling and, 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 you know, or context and, and uh, the right. lived so, experience, the embodied experience of life, you know? So and so how, that, do you, how, did you, how did your conversation go? How did you... you uh, we're going to talk again. It went so well. We really clicked really deeply. So, uh, you know, Rebel Wisdom, they recorded it. It will be uh, released at some point. Um, so a couple points on that. First of all... Um, because this goes to what we were talking about earlier, the, uh, uh, perhaps a uh, uh, more helpful way to think of right and left is to think, and, and, and I actually brought this up with Ian in person, and he said it was completely convergent with him. So I have good reason to believe I can speak sort of uh, uh, something that we are agreeing on, because mm -hmm. I have uh, in-person evidence, right? To think, uh, so you can, uh, because I came at it, I hadn't read Ian's work until about two weeks before I met, was going to meet him. Oh, okay, yeah. Because I came at this stuff and I came to similar conclusions from all the work I do on insight, right? Uh -huh. Insight problem solving. Um, so a good way to think about the right hemisphere is it's, it, it works more in terms of the gestalt. Yes, exactly, yeah. And, and, and so it likes wide open um, attention and it looks for, for, like for, uh, for, it's sort of pursuing pattern completion, right? And, right? Whereas the, the, left hemisphere is more featurely oriented and it does things in a step-by-step -step matter it's doing it's it's doing something more like a pro running a program than trying to complete a pattern it's sort of building features up step by step by step right mm. and so think about the kind of atten it, it, attention it needs it needs very narrow focused it looks for clarity yeah. for you know for it doesn't like ambiguity now here's it's what, the folk uh, idea of rationality would live in the the left brain, but not the well. And that's to and 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 that and that's I think part of our Cartesian heritage. That's to identify rationality with analysis. And Mary Cohen has brought this point up. And I think to identify rationality with analysis um, is a mistake. I think it's it, it, it well for all the reasons I've already articulated. It truncates uh, what rationality uh, should mean. 
uh, especially because rationality is about ratio, finding the patterns, rationing, mm -hmm. right? Getting the getting the proper context. It's a it's a much more logistical notion. Uh -huh. So why do we have these two? Well, the left hemisphere is very good for well-defined problems, problems in which you have a really good representation of your initial state, your goal state, what the mm -hmm. what actions and operations. What you already know. It tells you what yeah. you already know about what you already know. Yeah, it's familiar yeah. to you in a deep mm -hmm. way. So a multiplication problem would be for many people a very a well-defined familiar problem. Mm -hmm. Now, compare that to the problem of avoiding predation. Yeah. But what does that look like? Well, I'm avoiding, you know, well, uh, you know, I, I, what's my initial state? I, I'm not sure, right? Uh, right. Uh, you don't get a notepad and start yeah. to write. What you don't know what the goal state looks uh, like, right? Uh, uh, very clearly. Um, and, and, and this is the thing, Andrew. Most of our real world problems, this is why that, that notion of rationality of analysis are, 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 is so limiting. Most of our real world problems are actually like the problem of predation. They are ill-defined problems. You and I are trying to have a good conversation right now. Mm -hmm. What's the initial condition? Well, we're not talking. That's not very helpful. What's mm -hmm. the what's the what's what's the goal state look like? Well, I don't know. Are, does every good conversation look the same? No, they have some feature. What should I say? What should I do? Should I wave my hand? Should I, should I raise my voice? Should I like what should like right? You see what I mean? Or go yeah. on a successful first date. Or tell a yeah. joke. You can't draw a picture uh, uh, to tell somebody this is how you go on a successful first date. You, you can't give a. You can't go from A to B. Yeah. You can't give a program. There's no that program. Be, yeah. Right, but you can't. That doesn't mean it's useless. There are way we get better at going on dates. We get better at conversation. And think about yeah. that. Think about that. What I just said. How that goes back to what Socrates is doing in the dialogues. Right. You get better at becoming courageous. Right, but that doesn't mean I can give you a formula or a program for mm, courage. Yeah. Right. Now, when I when I when I was talking to you, like like I said, we really so Ian makes a distinction. It's kind of the reverse of the distinction I make. So it, it, I think it's, it, was, it was largely semantic. He actually makes the distinction between rationality and reason. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. That's what I wanted to to bring. Yeah, up. and I picked up on he that. Says reason is great because reason is holistic, and it's yes. how you you put everything together. Uh, and we should be reasonable, but but uh, but we're we're overemphasizing rationality and cutting right. things to bits. Yeah. So here's what I can say then, very clearly. I'm using rationality the way Ian uses reason. Exactly. And he's using yeah. reason, <laughs> right? The way I use rationality, right? Right. Uh, so um, sure. what he rejects is. Um, what I consider to be that truncated folk psychological notion of rationality that I think does not represent um, anything that will help facilitate our aspiration towards uh, wisdom. Hmm. Hmm. And so, yeah. although well, there is a problem. Maybe uh, the problem I'm seeing is that 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 notion of rationality is so deep. It's like it's Cartesian. It's woven in, in. It's woven into the scientific worldview. It's woven into our epistemological models, and those that worldview and those epistemological models get woven into our psychological models. They're woven into Freud. They're woven into Jung. They're they're woven into many. Uh, that's that, and you. That's why you. That's why you. That's why Guy is so attracted to Heidegger because yeah. Heidegger is like he's profoundly trying to break out of that whole Cartesian yeah. way of thinking about belief and truth and rationality and he's trying i think to get us back to a way of understanding rationality huh. and so philosophy. maybe what he calls thinking is yes. what you call rationality totally totally what heidegger calls thinking and what emma gilchrist calls reason <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah. yes we're just having different semantic areas here or yes i agree uh -huh. i agree so the the argument that i have sort of why i think rationality is actually an appropriate word is Reason tends to be associated with reasoning. But the problem with reason, it's equivocal. It can go to reasoning, which means inference and argument, uh -huh. or it can go to reasonable, which means this kind of thing we're talking about. So that's why I'm a little bit, whereas the etymological origin of, of rationality is ratio. It's finding proportion. It's, it's putting things into proper relation. It's getting the proper perspective. It's, it's more it's, about it's, relationship. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. It's more about pattern completion than, than running a program to completion. Those are two very, very different things. Also, we need to be unreasonable uh, at times. Uh, what do you mean by that? Because I, I, Well, I, I, we need to, as you say, break frame, right? So if we're, ah. if we're trying to be 
We're trying to be reasonable all the time. If you know, this is why there's shamanism. There, the you know, there were shamans and and uh, you know, to, to, as as you talked about in your series, uh, yeah, yeah, break out of the the yeah nine dot problem or yep. So, but this brings me to this brings me to an important point. Um, I would want to say because I actually I actually have brought this argument up. I've presented at a conference at a couple conferences. This idea that disruptive strategies are actually important for optimization. In fact, mm -hmm. yeah. they're systematically and reliably important for optimization. So if you're running a neural network, for example, and you just let it just sort of run, right? It'll overfit to the data. It'll, it'll find patterns in its sample and really pick up on those patterns in its sample that don't actually generalize, generalize to the population. It, you mm -hmm. know, this is sampling bias, right? Okay. And, and so, because the machines are so powerful and your brain is way more powerful than any neural network. So think about how you can really zero in, right? And get bound to, you can overfit uh, to your particular sampling of data. Mm -hmm. So what do you do in the neural networks? Well, you, you actually disrupt the network. You shut off some, you shut off half the nodes or you throw noise or static into the system. And what that does is it makes the neural network re self organize right? And yeah. that re self-organization actually allows it to now generalize in ways it couldn't generalize before. Yeah. So you have to throw disruption in. Well, I, I recently did some groff breathing uh, techniques, oh. things like that. And I, I, I don't do psychedelics, but, but, uh, but that kind of experience just, it throws you into these wild sort of spaces, right? Right. And it's uh, wild. Exactly. And, and that, and then you come out at the other side as if you've gone into Alice in Wonderland uh, and you come out the other side sort of like, uh, and you have to reassemble your ordinary existence. And hopefully you've, you've got some insight af after doing that. Um, yeah. And what, what happens is your perspectival and participatory knowing have been shifted. And so a, a new course of development is actually uh -huh. available to you. Yeah. Think about, think about, like when you're in that, when you're in that space, it's like what happens in dreams. A lot of variations are being thrown at, like sort of generated. So options are being created that open up what's called the state space. It opens up the possibilities that, that your brain can actually get itself into. Like, uh -huh. So your brain is a machine that's constantly making itself into a new kind of machine. And you want to periodically, like with a neural network, you want to open up. The, the options it can consider, not only the options in the world it can consider, but the options for what kind of machine it can be. It's those mm -hmm. two together at the same time, mm -hmm. right? And so if, it, and you, you can see this even in insight problem solving. If I give you an insight and I, get, and I moderately distract you, or even throw some static into the picture, some noise, that yeah. will actually help to trigger your insight. Of course, yeah. That's, okay, so- You get better at the game, right? If you're tripped up, a, a, um, but you, get, but you have to do it in the right way. It requires uh, finesse, right? Mm. So there's, an ex, there's a kind of expertise here. You have to do it in the right way, mm. right? There's no formula, but you have to do it in the right way. But there are systematic and reliable ways of getting better at doing that disruption. Now, here's my argument. This disruption is really indispensable to optimization. There mm. are systematic and reliable ways of doing that. Wouldn't that therefore be integral to our account of wisdom? that these disruptive processes, and that means that although they're non-inferential, they have actually no propositional content whatsoever because they're basically- Oh yeah, zero propositional content, right? But nevertheless, they move you towards a more optimal, that optimization of, you know, I, I have more options in what kind of cognitive being I can be, yeah. and there are more options about what kind of world I can dwell within, and that is making you more rational. Yeah. Well, it, it's, yeah, again, it's counterintuitive. Yeah. Well, I guess the, the rational world that we live in often feels like a, a kind of prison, right? Yes. We're, we're, we're trapped in con conceptual models of things. And that's one of the reasons why you would, you know, you would, you would want to, to break frame or uh, well, you know, do fasting or, or, you know, or go yeah. in, into, into nature and, and um, you know, ha have all kinds of, uh, let's say, of those kind of experiences. Well, this brings me to another point, and, uh, and you know, I think Ian's bang on about the left and right stuff. But there's another there's another opponent process that we need to bring into the discussion here, which is the relationship, like because we're constantly toggling between being task centered and mind wandering, right? 
Mm -hmm. um, and the the and the point of mind wandering, I would argue, at least one of its functions, mind wandering, huh? Yeah, it's to break frame. It's to it's to yeah. it's to bring in some mild distraction, take you into a weird. Sort that's of... Guy again, a <laughs> guy. Sorry, I keep saying yeah. Guy because I'm in France, but uh, I th I think that's that's what Guy does. Well, see, Heidegger was about wandering. So yeah. what he's trying to do is, I think, what Heidegger's doing is, you know, if you just stay on the path, that's like the machine that's going to overfit, right? And mm -hmm. what you need to do is you need to wander a bit, right? You need to go off almost like in mind wandering. And what that does is allow you to, you know, introduce some noise, introduce some variation, break some frame. So that, so, but you keep moving forward, but you're now actually improving your connectedness to the world rather mm -hmm. than just getting to your destination on your path. Ah, uh, yeah. And that, that also speaks to the pathology of modernity, right? Um, is that we don't, maybe we don't wander enough. We don't. We don't wander we, enough. Han says we don't. We fill up the enough. space too much with, with, with uh, you know, information. Yeah. And salience. And, and, um, and we, it, it, like, that, that's why I also pointed out Han's notion of lingering. It's not only that we fill up the space, we... Right, we, we, well, take Heidegger, being yeah. in time, that your being is inher inherently temporal, right? And so your, your perspectival and participatory knowing of time, because you don't know time in any other way, right? Mm -hmm. Augustine famously said this, I know what time is until somebody asks me what it is, because, right, you only know time by being in time, right, by being a mm -hmm. temporal thing. Mm -hmm. But so your existential mode with respect to time, how you're experiencing, that's the wrong word, but it's the only word I have, how you're mm -hmm. participating, maybe let me, let me use that word, how you're participating in time existentially has a huge impact on the kind of being you can be. And so Han's point is, we are moving into a culture in which we can't linger, we can't, we can't, we can't flow with things. We, everything is atomized. We're going well, down. Just like the, minutes and seconds. Uh, you know, time yes, is, time is, is, uh, is um, cut up. That's exactly <laughs> the idea. Moments, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you, you don't get any flow. You get, you get the, um, you, you get sort of the salient second, right? Uh, you know, um, so a lot of people have been, uh, met, uh, talked to me about this and, you know, we're seeing, uh, we're, we're seeing this consistent trend towards the death of melody in popular music that mm -hmm, we're losing right. melodic complexity and that well then we have to just compress sound all the time with mp3s yeah. it's extreme compression of sound extreme um, compression of sound and salience it, and salience and intensity are uh taking up the place of right complexity and development uh -huh, right sure. so you don't have to follow a long piece of music and go through all kinds of transformation you can instantly without effort get sort of hit by the same product right, right yeah, the, yes uh, exactly yeah and that's and so what that means for us is yeah, that uh like i said it's it's also that we can't linger we can't stay with things in a way that affords us remembering the projects of aspiration yeah i think of like going to the galleries like i live near in paris and and um um there's all these galleries and how many people look at a painting you know yes how many people go into it and actually just stay with the painting and look at the painting and, and find that a valuable experience, right? Yes. Most yes. people would 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 sort of you know look at the painting and like take a snapshot. you know picture snapshot of it yeah. with their iPhone and say I've been there and I've seen that painting, yeah. but but uh, but that that goes to just what I said. The point yeah. is to collect atoms, to collect yeah. moments that are atomized and are removed from a flow of development. They're just snapshots. Okay. Yeah, right? I think I think the remedy to that. One of the remedies I've seen is, is is probably meditation in some sense because, yep, for for our modern times, you know, I, I think so. because it's how else can you how else can you because there's so much stimulus all the time how else can you take a break from that and, um, I think I think I think I think both meditation and contemplation are mm -hmm. are needed sure because uh, you have to break frame and make frame um, I I think uh, being able to enter into dialogos. To enter into a conversation. Oh, that's a that, new thing for me. Like that's like yeah. I, I've been meditating for years, but but you and Guy and that, that's a that's a new kind of possibility for me. I hadn't really thought of that so much. <laughs> oh. Well, I mean, this is the this is part of the Platonic notion that um, 
training your rationality in the sense I've been arguing for and training your sociality are deeply interpenetrating things. That's why he presents his philosophy in a dialogue because mm-hmm. you're not, you're, you're, those, two, those two things, our ability to connect to distributed cognition and participate in collective intelligence and collective rationality, or dare I say it, collective wisdom, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's in resonance with our individual project of aspiring to rationality and wisdom. These two things mutually afford and depend on each other. Mm, awesome, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, and also I, I was just sort of thinking about how how um, why this sort of conversation is compelling oh. to, to people and, and stuff. Which it, it's kind of a weird thing. It's like a homeless. We're like homeless here or something. Yeah. I was saying that to to to, uh, to guy last night. It's like we're putting in these videos on, on YouTube. It's not part of the mainstream culture, um, but it seems to be a, there seems to be a need for 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 that kind of. Kind of oh, totally. I think the the online world. I mean, it has it has sort of it has some of the greatest magnifiers of the things that exacerbate the meaning crisis. Yeah. But you know, Heidegger talks about where you know where I think he's uh, Holderlein. He quotes where the danger is. There, there also. Oh, you know, right. Where the future grows. I think it's a translation. Mm-hmm. I might have mistranslated. But the basic idea is, you know. Because it's it's a, it's destabilizing the system. It's also it also it can be an affordance of the system going through self transcendence rather than disintegration. Or you could even so say I, death and rebirth of some yeah kind, kind of thing. Or, or yeah. Goes back to a sh- shamanic kind of idea. Hmm. And uh, so what what I think what's happening with the Chris and I talk about the meta conversation. We have all these conversations, and then what YouTube is doing is setting up this thing where people are having conversations, but they're doing them with the awareness, right? The connectivity to other conversations. So mm-hmm. there's not only a dialogos within a conversation, there's this dialogos that's taking place between all of these conversations and the way they constrain and impregnate and engender each other in this kind of complex self-organizing dynamic, which is really, really important. Because you see the same thing again, at least analogous in the platonic dialogues. You shouldn't just ever read one platonic dialogue, that's a mistake. Mm-hmm. You should read because you should read all of it's the an ecosystem again of, of yes, all of yes, exactly. All of the dialogues are speaking uh-huh. to and influencing and changing and affecting each other in powerful ways. And we're doing something analogous to that. Here's a dialogue, and yeah. then you've got one with Guy, and then they're t- they'll talk to each other and speak to each other. In powerful yeah, that that will inform me to speak to you, and then somebody else might get a little something yep. out of this and bring it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, to bring a, 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 a Socratic Platonic thing in, there's a, the possibility for anagogue. That's that reciprocal opening that you and I have talked about before. Uh-huh. Right? Uh-huh. So a good conversation, when it when it moves into dialogos, you've got the reciprocal opening that's happening. And that, of course, is, again, a kind of love, right? Because when uh-huh. people get into reciprocal opening, they, the experience, they have the experience of the uh, affective state. Love isn't an emotion. It's a higher order affective state. But it's, a, it's an affective state yeah. right, of love. And that's again how the rationality and the sociality and the love are all bound together. Uh-huh, we should gotcha. put them all back together. Uh huh. Gotcha. Yeah. They're they're all sort of in little islands over here, and they need to come into yeah. one 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 place. Exactly. Uh-huh. Exactly. Uh huh. Hmm. That's why that's why I'm as critical of romanticism as I am of empiricism, because mm-hmm. both of them keep all of those things apart, but for different reasons, for different positions that they hold. And different epistemologies and metaphysics yeah. and i think all of them are therefore equally at fault for keeping those things apart um now i mean i'm doing a bit of a you know a gloss well, that was my other it. question actually i wrote that down yeah. it's like what what can we what can we take from romanticism because romanticism is so powerful it's so uh you know well, it's but so, that's it's the so, thing so, so it's so uh you know, it's yeah, so, no, no, we no. need that and on, on some level especially in our um you know, an online world, people are so blasé and stuff. We, we need to, we need, I, I don't know. I have a feeling that, um, that we need, we need grander sort of experiences and emotions that, 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 that we're being too uh, polite and timid. And, and it's, it's like being in a cage of some kind. And romanticism is like trying to break that cage a little bit. It is. I mean, 
So again, I was going to engage in some self-criticism and you've actually uh, allowed me to do so. So thank you for that. I mean, I, I, I try to make a distinction between what I call decadent romanticism, which is sort of our folk psychological version of romanticism, uh -huh, and sure. culture, right? Uh, and sometimes I have not been careful enough about that. And so I do apologize to people. Um, because you have to take a look at like just like I don't think you should talk about postmodernism in, in like oh, just, sure. mm. you should zero in on particular thinkers and particular arguments because there's variation. Um, and so um, here's what I want to say, and, and especially the I don't even know I want to call them romantics. The the early uh, the you know the early post Kantians like Schlegel and people like that um, I, I think are actually saying things remarkably similar to what I'm trying to argue for, um, and. But the romanticism that you get, especially Rousseau's version of romanticism, yeah, which, right. is a, which is a prototypical version of it, is the thing about romanticism, and, and I want to say this, I want to try and say, convey something, and I'm going to say it carefully and hopefully provocatively. It's closer to the truth than, the empir than empiricism, and therefore it's, it's, it's more dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more dangerous. Is uh, that because it's not contained? In, uh, it's say, because... You know, it's, it's not contained in a collective experience. It's, it's sort of okay. There's there's that. So you've got Rousseau's um, um, glorification of individual subjectivity. Okay, you know that's clearly in Rousseau, right? Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, he does have stuff about the general will, but when we're talking about how he's a, a father of uh, romanticism, the, the the glorification of individual subjectivity is there. Uh, the idea that you come with a true self that you must be true to, which is antithetical to the idea of aspiration. So it's antithetical mm -hmm. to the Socratic right. ideal of aspiration. The idea that um, this subjectivity should be thought of. So how, how am I trying to? What when Rousseau's talking about it, he he's he does not express enough worry about the prob the problem of self deception. Sort of separating all of this from rationality, as I've tried to describe it, to describe it right? The, the Socratic notion of overcoming the ways in which we deceive ourselves and bullshit ourselves. Yeah. This exploration and expression of your individual subjectivity and your capacity by through imagination and will for imposing an order on the world. Well, think about how that could just be filled with self-deception. Right, like you know, like, you know, I, I, like projection and bias and prejudice, like all of those things, right? And so, yeah. romanticism doesn't. It's it's separated itself off from deep concerns uh, about um, human, uh, the human proclivity for self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior, which is why mm -hmm. we we get the, the the almost the romantic trope of you know how living romantically ultimately is kind of self-destructive of the people who try to, to to live that way you can see that in you know sort of weathering heights kind of stuff right oh, oh yeah <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah yeah my mother read that book like 20 times <laughs> so, so, so there's it's so appealing to people uh, uh, yeah i guess there's a self uh, um destructive element in, in that or well there can also be. A, a hatred of civilization or a hatred of yeah. our efforts to 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 you know um, you know build things and yep yep so there there is a lot of so it was a terrific and I I, I want to catch both senses of that word it mm -hmm. was a terrific terrific strategy for breaking the frame of empiricist enlightenment for breaking the frame that John Locke gave us of the tabula uh -huh. rasa mind and the world imposes itself and the finger of the world writes on my mind. It was a great counteractive to that. Yeah. But I think it, it generates its own frame that needs to be broken and broken beyond. Oh, that's well said. Yeah, that's great. Mm. Mm. That's why Heidegger is so interested in being because, right, and, and in challenging the idea that we should impose our will on the world, right? That the world is just a standing reserve because part of what Heidegger's trying to get us to remember is, you know, Locke has the mind as a blank slate, but Rousseau has the world as a blank canvas upon which we paint our subjectivity. Mm -hmm. And Heidegger is trying to get us to remember, no, no, it's not a blank canvas. It's a world. 
It is deep and profound and beyond us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Mm. And it discloses itself, you know. As it will. Who's uh -huh. I've heard two pronunciations, and I keep getting corrected by both camps on how I should pronounce uh, the Greek term. I, I was, I was in my intellect, in my undergrad, everybody pronounced it as phusis, but I've now been told, no, it's not more like phesis or physis or something, or physis, right? That's the um, word disclosure in, in Heidegger? Well, it's the word that we get physics from, but it, mean, oh. it, it means the oh. way in which nature blossoms from itself, uh, blooms from itself, but also the way in which nature loves to hide itself. Ah, right. yeah, 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 right, right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Heidegger is another subject. Yeah, that's. Yeah, yeah and I mean, I'm having um, uh, excellent conversations with Johannes about this, and uh, I think it's up on his channel. I'm going to put up the dialogue that I had with him. Excellent. We're going to have another, and he and Guy and I are going to talk shortly about sort of Heidegger. Uh, but I'm going to put up the the dialogue I had with Johannes. I'm doing the, I'm doing a couple new series, right? I'm doing. The Minding Media series, but I'm also doing this series. I haven't titled it yet, but where I'm having just I'm trying to exemplify dialectic, which is the psychotechnology of engendering dialogos. I'm trying mm -hmm. to exemplify that and get into these like these discussions where we're exemplifying and explicating what do, what does spirituality mean within the scientific worldview and the meaning crisis? What does that mean for us? Uh huh. Right. And he, we had an excellent conversation on. Heidegger and science and technology. Yeah, I loved it. I, I saw I saw about half of it, and I was I, I, I oh, it's up on his channel, heard. I guess. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna re release it on mine later. The other, uh, do you think you've said what you wanted to say about 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 wisdom and 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 uh, and rationality and well, intelligence? Say, is there is there any is there I any say loose ends thing. here? Yeah, I want to say one more thing about sort of clarifying a bit the relationship between wisdom and rationality. <clears throat> I think that we should think of ecologies of practices for each one of the kinds of knowing that make us more rational. So, you know, ecologies of practices for <clears throat> propositional knowing, ecologies of practices for procedural knowing, ecologies of uh, practices for perspectival and participatory. So Do you that have some, some examples? Um, well, I think the ecology of practice for propositional knowing, we've, we've, we've got, I mean, that's what we, and we think we know what we're talking about when we use this term I'm going to use, but if you do any philosophy around this, we don't actually know what we mean. And this is the term science. Mm -hmm. <laughs> science is oh, a wow, whole yeah. ecology of practices, and it's bound up with history, right? Uh -huh. and, and it's this way of trying to get uh, to be as rational as we can, because sci the scientific method, it's actually a family of methods, is not about coming to certain conclusions. It's about really trying to reduce the influence of self-deception on our inferential processes and our propositional knowing. That's what actually is going on. The sci science is largely about trying to set things up so that we can break through our patterns of self-deception, right? Mm -hmm. Now, you have similar things, right, in your procedural knowing. <clears throat> and this is where, you know, I think the martial art traditions give us fantastic examples mm -hmm. right. of how to cultivate ecologies of practices. And this is where Rafe Kelly is just doing some amazing and important work right, <clears throat> on, 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 on this kind of thing, not, right? Um, the, the way he's using parkour and integrating it with martial art practice and mindfulness, like, go and see some of the, his videos, see some of the uh, dialogues I've had with him. Mm -hmm. um, the perspectival knowing, well, that, that of course, that's where the, all the stuff on attention and awareness, the mindfulness practices, right? The flow induction practices are really important. Mm -hmm. And the participatory okay. knowing, that's where the theologos, that's what this is. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Participatory we're, knowing. We're yeah. trying to. We're trying to. We're trying to alter our not just our our thoughts, but our identities, the way in which we're mutually shaping each other, the way we're being, the way us and the world are engaging. So I'm I'm entering into reciprocal opening with you, but together we're also trying to enter into reciprocal opening with the world, right? Uh -huh. And so yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. So here's my point. There, let's say there are reliable, systematic and reliable kinds of rationality for each of the kinds of knowing. There's propositional rationality, procedural rationality, perspectival rationality, and participatory. Then you need something that optimizes the relationship between all of those rationalities. Hmm. That's wisdom. Hmm. 
Hmm. Uh -huh. So wisdom is about the relationship. Between it's about all between between all. It's about the, it's kind of the the whole. Or, yes. or the mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Okay, I see. It's kind of it's wisdom is very much a kind of meta rationality, right? Yeah. At least that's how I would argue. And I think that I think that it's not identical to what is that the, like gnosis that the word gnosis came to me to me is that um, is, I think of, that no I tend to think of each one of them I tend to think of <clears throat> episteme for propositional techne mm -hmm. okay. uh, for procedural noesis for perspectival and gnosis for participatory and then I think Sophia and phronesis describe the two aspects of wisdom the bottom up aspect that's phronesis and the top down as so when i'm wow. when i'm coordinating those four kinds of knowing i need a powerful i need a lot of bottom up and i need a lot of top down i need phronesis and i need sophia uh-huh awesome awesome wow that's that's a whole structure you've um... well uh, you know it, it goes towards the work i'm doing with uh daniel craig on the cognitive continuum by the way i i, I just want to mention i have an indiegogo campaign uh for uh and I'm not getting any money from that campaign or from the book. The money is, I'm, I'm a university professor. I get a salary. I'm fine. Yeah. Daniel is a student, and he's committing to working on this book with me. And it's not yeah. just writing. He's generating art. He's putting together. He's basically like, you know, like the movie producer as well as a co-author. Mm. So this money is to help to support him as he's doing all of this work. But that what we're talking about in the cognitive continuum is exactly this, because I think and I try to argue that in the series, I think we can get also, instead of like, instead of building a mystique around these terms, and, and this is where uh, like Evan Thompson's work, I think is really important. Also, uh, Stephen Batchelor, both of them are now post Buddhist um, mm -hmm. because they object to Buddhist, Buddhist exceptionalism. The idea that Buddhism is somehow a special or privileged religion compared to all the rest because it's somehow scientific um and i oh, agree with you. yeah I, I object to that as well i i, 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 I knew you would i knew you would and, and you have to remember that both stephen and, and i know I've, i've met stephen had dinner with him and evan is a colleague and friend of mine they're both deep they're deep friends of buddhism these are not hostile yeah, yeah. The outside right and so right they point to the fact that the, the, what's happened is this let's take a term like enlightenment it's bound up with entire cultural projects and world views, and it, it often has this mystique around it. I remember, I, let me t t tell you how this frustrates me. I, you know, I've asked Buddhists, you know, how many people in the world do you think are enlightened right now? And they'll say, well, probably no one. And then it's sort of in my mind, I go, well, what the heck is it for then? Right? I mean, the term is meaningless, right? And, and uh -huh. so, so I think instead, just like I tried to, if you'll allow me, I tried to re reverse engineer wisdom. I tried to build it up out of, yeah. right? And, and, and in terms of what we want it to do and how we're, well, I think we should do the same thing with enlightenment. I think enlightenment is we should reverse engineer it. Oh, it's a terrible word, isn't it? It's just, it's a terrible word. And, <laughs> and what I think yeah. we should do is, right, this, this, this is how I want to use the word. And maybe we should use a different word because, because of the critiques that Stephen and especially Evan are making. But I want, any so once i have wisdom it, the two are going to be bound together i want a wise ecology of practices that helps me transform cognition consciousness character and communitas so that i can systematically and reliably overcome the perennial problems of self-deception and self-destruction and afford enhancing all of the connections what i call religio that are so constitutive of meaning in life for me that's enlightenment mm -hmm. it, because i don't I, if, it, if it has to be some other deep metaphysical thing i don't care because i want to be able to help people alleviate you know the suffering of the perennial problems and afford the flourishing of enhanced connectivity to themselves to each other in the world Mm, yeah so you want to stay within in the real i guess uh i want to and i'm going to stipulate how i'm going to use the term and i'm trying I'm, and so there i'm i'm saying i'm not using it ambiguously i'm trying to not use it in a way that is loaded into a particular uh, uh i mean I, I can't be completely free of a cultural worldview but i'm not trying to bind it to a particular cultural tradition instead i'm trying to pick up on what science gives us access to is universal features and principles of our cognition and then build a notion 
that is pragmatically engineered for a specific set of what badly and widely needed goals. Hmm. Yeah. So I guess the reason this this term is so offensive is that it kind of I was just thinking that it kind of it implies a, a pr an end product or something. It, 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 so I'm deeply critical of that. I'm deeply critical of sort of the perfection completion uh, aspects of the term enlightenment. Uh -huh. I'm deeply critical of the the people refuse to acknowledge that they're sliding between something that's explaining the world and something that's evaluating the world, right? It's to use sort of technical language, and this is one of Evans' criticisms, like you don't want to, you don't want to confuse your best description of how reality is with your your best sort of normative claims about how things should be. Those aren't those aren't the same. And so for example, wh why does that matter? Well, science isn't doing that second thing. Science is not in the project of this is the way things should be. This is the, you know, this is moral, this is moral excellence. This is aesthetic excellence. Science isn't in the, it doesn't have the machinery for doing that. Science is about trying to give the best explanations. Um, it doesn't really afford us in our aspirational projects. And so I think Buddhism is an aspirational project. And therefore to pretend that it's sort of, a, a, it's, it's, a, it's also deeply scientific Ah, that's a category mistake. Yeah, it's a category mistake for sure. It's not, you know, so, science is one way of knowing, right? And then Buddhism might be another. I, I would right. Say. And, and, well, and, and I think right. Buddhism is it, it addresses something that science doesn't address, which is an uh, aspirational project of transformation and self transcendence. Uh -huh. And right, and that is going to have a historical cultural aspect to it, right? Yeah. So. I think what we should do, what we're trying to do, what Daniel and I are trying to do is, well, let's look at different cultural models and then let's look at this engineering, this pragmatically engineering sense of enlightenment that I've just given you. And let's put them into dialogue and try and get some convergent thing that maybe has less of the off-putting mystique of a lot of, because, you know, when you when you talk to people about enlightenment, it's, it, it, it verges on the, you know, the supernatural and the, the person is becoming godlike. Uh -huh. and, it's like, and it's like, well, if that's what it is, then, and I don't mean this disrespectfully to Buddhists, but I'm not interested in that. I'm mm -hmm. really not interested in... in, in, in and godlike people are... are yeah, are... yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm interested, I, you know, I, I, I'm interested in the aspiration to becoming more and more at one with sort of the sacred depths of reality. But that's yeah. very different from... It's a that's a question of growth, not a question of some ultimate state or... Yes, some ultimate state and some, and some ultimate transhuman state. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a bit of a Nietzschean critique in, in my head here about stop, like, yeah, you, you should be overcoming yourself, but you should never be abandoning your humanity in that project. Um, mm -hmm. so, I see. Yeah. I, I guess... I guess I'm going to say something a little a bit provocative here. I I find humanity ultimately good enough. This is why I love Conrad so much. The Heart of Darkness. You compare Marlowe and Kurtz. Kurtz uh -huh. takes on the hubristic past of becoming a god, right? And then he suffers the horror, the horror, the horror. Yeah. Marlowe makes conscious decision to act to exercise restraint and stay with his humanity. Right, that he will not, even though he'll follow the journey, he'll go all the way to seeing Kurtz, he will never abandon his humanity. That's why the heart of darkness, I think, is such a yeah. powerfully important myth. Well, that seems to be the Bodhisattva vow, if, if I'm defending Buddhism a little bit. Okay, sure. Uh -huh, is, 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 is to do just that, isn't it? It's not, it's not to yeah, accept. To say, yeah. I think the Bodhisattva, it might have been a bit of a corrective then in Mahayana for Theravadin, because uh, the, the Bodhisattva is there for... Right, much more different than the arhat in some ways. Yeah, that's that's a good thought. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, the, because there is a there is a commitment to staying with humanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so well, that's, you know, that's cool. and and that that every being is your they call it mother being. It's like every being is your mother, and and you you have to liberate every being. It's it's a yeah. wild sort of idea, but it's it's a sort of wild heroic idea that's. But, it, but it's not deep. very rational, certainly, or, or not. Well, I think it's rational rational. in the way I would it say. Is but... Here we go again. <laughs> it's just a, I can't get the folk rational <laughs> idea out of my head. But I, I like that. I'm the sorry. Is a, is a way of deeply binding the Enlightenment project to humanity. 
Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point, Andrew. That's a really good point. I hadn't thought of that. 